this is a 60 acre conservation farm which we purchased about 15 years ago. Um, prior to acquiring this land, Native Seed Search did all of its grow outs um, in a small half acre plot in Tucson, um, which is great for convenience, but uh, water was very expensive and it just wasn't enough land. So we purchased this property, and now this is where we do all of our seed grow outs for conservation, for um, research and evaluation purposes, uh, to grow seed for distribution, grow, grow some food, um, grow some crops for food, do some educational uh, events here, um, and so on. So it's really one of one of our um, one of our fundamental assets as an organization, and really critical to our conservation work. So let's let's head out this way, and I can show you a little bit what we're doing. Um, probably the most important thing we do here is replenish crops from our seed bank, which is located in Tucson. We have a collection of close to 2,000 um, different varieties of agricultural crops from the Southwest, uh, collected over a period of about 20 years, starting in the early 80s. Um, as a seed bank, one of our uh, primary concerns is keeping these these accessions, these crops, um, alive indefinitely, and documenting them and getting them back into use by farmers and gardeners. So distributing the seeds. Um, if we if we simply kept them frozen in the seed bank and didn't get them out to anybody, there'd be really no reason to have them. So it's really all about getting them used. Um, getting them back onto, into fields and back onto tables so that they're really benefiting humanity. So, um, even under the best storage conditions, you know, we keep, we keep the seeds dry, we keep them dark, we keep them cold in the freezer or a walk-in cooler. Even under those ideal conditions, seeds will gradually lose viability uh, and die over time. So, periodically we have to take each of those 2,000 accessions uh, take a sample of the seeds, bring them here to the farm, and grow them, and keep them isolated genetically from other accessions, other varieties of the same species, or, or related species that might cross with it. Um, that's because our one of our primary concerns is maintaining the genetic purity of each of those varieties. Um, now there's, there's certainly an argument to be made for, for doing some breeding work, some selection work, and so on, and we're starting to do some of that. But first and foremost, we want to make sure that we're minimizing the genetic change, the amount of evolution that these crops are experiencing. Because um, most of the most of the accessions in our collection, most of the varieties, are what are known as land races. These are um, traditional varieties that, in this case, Native American peoples have have developed over thousands of years. They they tend to be very genetically diverse, um, intentionally so. Um, the, the diversity provides a degree of resilience that you lose if you if you're growing a homogeneous uh, crop, and we want to we want to maintain all that diversity to the extent that we can. Now, every time you grow, we grow one of them. Invariably, there's going to be some genetic change. We just can't eliminate all evolution. There's going to be some some degree of natural selection, probably some artificial selection, as unintentionally um, some especially some degree of drift. So all those things are contributing to, to slight changes in the, in the variety, but we try to minimize those. So we do that by growing as many plants of, of, of the crop as we can, have as, as large a population as we can, uh, keep them genetically isolated by um, either keeping them caged, as in some of these crops here, uh, so that insects aren't cross-pollinating them, um, in some cases, we do hand pollination, such as with the corn, also with some of the, um, the squash and the gourds and some other crops. We'll actually manually um, keep the flowers, uh, keep the pollen um, from, from spreading to other varieties. Uh, in some cases, such as tomatoes and some other things, um, these are self-pollinating um, plants. We can get away often with, um, with not doing any sort of controlled pollination. Uh, it really just depends on the, the biology of the, the, the particular plant. Um, so what we have here are uh, several cages, or quite a few cages, 
On this side, it's mostly beans. There's several different species of beans represented here. Um, some of them, such as this, the one that's in this cage here, is this is a common bean, Fasciolus vulgaris. These ra very rarely um, cross with uh, with other other plants of the same species. They're predominantly um, self-pollinating, but insects do occasionally cross-pollinate them. So to be absolutely s sure um, that there's not any contamination, we grow them in cages, even though it's probably superfluous in, in that case. Some of the other beans actually require insect pollination, like the scarlet runner bean. Um, so in, in that case, we have to be a little more um, creative in how we, how we deal with uh, the pollination issue. Either introduce um, bumblebees into the cages or um, alternate days and opening, opening each cage so that only a single uh, variety is exposed to the insects on a given day. Um, so on, or only grow one variety of, of the species in a given year. That's another option. Um, we also have tomatoes and chilies in these cages. I, I mentioned tomatoes are mostly self-pollinating, but they're not always self-pollinating, so that's another case where, um, because we want to be as absolutely sure that uh, purity <laughs> as possible, we go the extra, the extra length to grow them in cages. Um, now corn is probably, arguably, the most important crop in the southwest, um, and that's represented, actually has the longest, corn has the longest history, known history of cultivation in the southwest, uh, at least 4,000 years. Um, the oldest known uh, archaeological evidence of corn in the United States comes from the Tucson area, and also um, from Hopi and Zuni Pueblos. Um, these are 4,000 year old um, cobs of corn. And those, those early, um, those 4,000 year old corn cobs come from a variety that archaeologists call pre chapalote. And it was a, um, basically a flint, almost a popcorn, uh, very small ears. This here is chapalote. This is the closest living thing we have to, to that, that early variety. Um, so this variety has been grown in this area for for probably 4,000 years, or its or its um, you know its ancestors. Um, we we have a project right now in which we are trying to br bring back this variety, Chapalote, bring bring it back into production in the Southwest, um, as well as uh, a heritage wheat variety called White Sonora, um, which has about 300 years. Of, of history of being grown in Sonora and Arizona, um, white Sonora, which we won't see, but we have, we grew some in the in our northern field up there, uh, and it's a little bit still growing. But um, that's a variety of wheat that was basically responsible for the invention of the flour, the wheat flour tortilla, because of its its elastic properties. It could be um, it could be pounded out or patted out into into huge tortillas, um, which gave rise to the to the burrito and the chimichanga and so on. Um, so those two those two heritage grains are the focus of, of this grant funded project we have uh, currently. Uh, we're working with several other farmers, several other farms in southern Arizona to get these crops grown, get them milled, get them um, back into uh, into distribution so that people can be can be eating them again. We're currently selling white white sonora flour. Uh, at our store. Um, hope to have some chapalote later in the year after we harvest it. Uh, so that's one example of, of, a, of sort of a special project we have beyond our normal conservation work. Um, and I, the focus on, on grains in this case is um, unusual for projects like this because so much of the emphasis in local food um, activities has been on fruits and veggies and that sort of thing. Uh, and grains have been mostly overlooked um, for for probably varying reasons in different areas. Um, one one problem is that grains such as wheat um, and so on are pretty pretty challenging to grow on a small scale to grow and harvest and, and process. So you know, it requires some pretty significant infrastructure, a combine, um, some pretty sophisticated cleaning equipment. Uh, and, and so on. So that's been an impediment to, 
small scale local grain project. So we're we're trying to figure out how to make it economically sustainable and logistically feasible um, to do small scale grain production. Yeah. You mentioned that um, a lot of the uh, varieties have really high genetic diversity, mm -hmm. and that was just inherent in their, um, uh, I guess, in their inception. But how do you maintain a big genetic diversity when it seems like these plots are fairly small? Yeah, we have to balance um, the ideal of maximizing genetic diversity or reduce, minimizing the amount that we lose with the reality of um, maintaining 2,000 varieties. Um, so our population sizes are not as large as we would like, but we, we do the best we can. Um, so, yeah, you know, with corn, we try to grow 400 or 500 plants, which is the minimum that, that corn geneticists recommend in order to not um, see problems with inbreeding depression. Um, for crops like squash and gourds and some of the other cucurbits, we aim for 50 plants minimum. And that's just to maintain a just wide genetic pool. Yeah, and so, you know, invariably we're going to lose some of the rarer, some of the rarer alleles, some of the rarer uh, genes. Yeah. There's just no way to avoid that in any, any seed bank um, in, their, in their regeneration activities. It's just a given. But um, you do the best you can and hope for the best. I would imagine that a lot of these are um, they're adapted to certain locations as well, either really arid zones or really wet zones. How do you think that growing them in this one location might damage some of that um, adapt adaptation? So we really try not to uh, apply any selection or, or let this location apply too much selection. You know, again, it's impossible to eliminate that. But um, we, as much as possible, um, try to get a balanced sample of seeds from as many of the plants in the population as possible. We'll do, um, for instance, with squash, we'll take multiple flowers from multiple parent plants and then male flowers and pollinate, you know, multiple female flowers from multiple other plants. Uh, and that thereby um, try to get as much of an equal genetic representation as possible in, to the next generation. So, yeah. I've always wondered to what degree you work with uh, outside agents, call them contractors maybe, uh, to grow out some stuff and you know, sort of train them on how to do this kind of stuff very carefully. Yeah, we. Um, it's funny you ask that because we're currently working on a grant proposal to cool. do exactly that cool. with native um, farmers in the, in the Southwest. Um, because of our limitations with um, having to hand pollinate things like corn, which is a huge amount of labor, but um, we have 500 plus varieties of corn in the collection. We have to maintain all of those. Um, we can only grow one at a time unless we want to do hand pollination. So it's, it's very difficult to, to grow large quantities of any, any variety of corn. So what we want to do is contract with other growers um, so that they can, do, they can grow out larger quantities for you like And so we want to offer um, seed school training to them. Almost sort of like our own certification um, program. And then you would have to have some kind of controls on that to make sure that they're following like, what they Right, we would, we would provide some training to them. We'd have to do site visits, you know, to verify that things are um, being kept as pure as possible. Yeah. Are these ones deep planted or average planted? Or they, they happen to be, did you plant them deep? Why are they so deep. tall, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> Why are they so tall? Yeah. Well, um, this is, you know, I mentioned that Chapalote comes from, has been grown in the southwest for a long time, and that's true, but it fell out of production in Arizona and Sonora, gradually. Um, the, the place where we found, where our collectors found it, still being grown, was in northern Sinaloa, which is a much more tropical climate. And tropical corn tends to be taller. So, um, we'd actually like to start doing selection on this, even though I said we, we're not doing selection, we try to avoid that. Um, in this case, we're only growing these, this chapalote for, for distribution, seed distribution. We, and because it's 
it's more tropically well, adapted. We want to start selecting for earlier maturation, bugs. shorter, mm -hmm. shorter stalks, and also select for darker color. Um, so this is our first, our first step in that process, our first grow out um, in, in that selection process. So if this is used to more tropical climates, do you have to water it more? No, it's still it's still pretty drought tolerant, and actually our farm is really wet in the summer. Um, I think we maybe had the water once this whole summer. Uh, not even positive if we had to, if we had to do that. But um, it's actually it's actually a challenge for us because we want to be able to do um, drought tolerant experiments and you know get an idea of how toler how how drought tolerant these plants are. But we can't do it here, so um, we're we're talking about trying to build some sort of rainwater exclusion greenhouse so that we can grow stuff and control how much water they're actually getting. <laughs> it's a funny problem to have in the southwest. <laughs> so is there any reason for the, the orientation of the rows going, like, what is that, northwest? Yeah, well, there are two reasons. One is that the, the wind tends to come from that direction, so we don't want to put the rows uh, perpendicular to the wind. They'd be more prone to blowing over. The other the other reason is that this, this field slopes slightly down that direction. Um, so that's just the natural way that the water flows when we irrigate. So I just want to ask you a question. When I was young, I used to do this thing called corn detasseling in Iowa. We'd go <laughs> and pull all the tassels on the top of the corn. And I see you have the bags over the, yep. the, the ears. cobs or ears. Yeah. What, so I was thinking all the pollination came from up there. Well, yeah, so it's a two-step process. You do, um, we'll go out a few days or maybe a week before we plan to do the pollination. We'll find all of the... All of the young shoots, which form the, the ears, um, we cut them with a knife. At, try to, it, it takes practice, but you need to get it at the right level so that you you um, you don't slice any of the cob, but you um, you cut the silks, the, the young silks, such that um, after you bag them and let it grow for a few more days, the silks will emerge and create this little brush. Um, then the day before we're going to do the pollinations, we'll we'll put a bag over the tassels. Um, or actually the same morning. You can also do it the same morning. Do you call that the tassel? The tassel. Yeah. That's the, the male yeah. flower, or the male inflorescence. Um, it's these bags that we put over there. Uh, when you're ready to pollinate, so you do this in the morning because the pollen can't, can't survive in the heat for very long, only like 20 minutes. Um, bend it over with, with the bag over it. Whack it a few times to dislodge as much pollen as possible. Take the bag off. Go to a different plant not the same plant, go to a different plant that has a, an ear that, that you've cut and bagged a few days before. And you want to find the one that has, find one that has the silks emerging maybe an inch or two. They'll create, they'll create a little brush. And that, the reason to do that is that um, you're able to then pour the pollen onto all of the, all of the silks and get maximum pollination that way. And if you didn't cut the silks, it would be just sort of this, this mass, like, like, uh, long hair just kind of um, drooping over and some of those silks would probably be masked by silks on top so you wouldn't get quite as good pollination. So you have to do plant? that for every single ear that you want to pollinate. So. <laughs> and why a different plant? Just for biodiversity? Or? Yeah, to, so that each of those kernels has two parents. You maximize genetic diversity that way. Oh, very cool. This is a landrace sesame from South Carolina actually, not in our region, but um, we were told that this this variety of sesame um, provides protection against soil-borne uh, nematodes, ne uh, pathogenic nematodes. So we're growing it out just to see, first of all, how well it does here, and it's done beautifully. Um, and then second of all, so we can start to think about uh, incorporating it into a cover crop rotation system, or even you know produce uh, grow it for seed or food uh, production. Um, Sesame is a, a very drought tolerant plant, so um, it's sort of a natural crop to, to look at. Um, then we have several beans, several beans um, in this field. These are, well, a couple of these are, are Tohono O'odham varieties, which we're growing for seed distribution only. Uh, they're, these are common beans. Um, here in this region, they'd be grown primarily in the spring. And, and possibly also in the fall, because that species, the common uh, Fazioles vulgaris, does not do as well in, in intense heat. Uh, we get away with it here in Patagonia because we're higher up, but in its traditional 
Um, the tra traditional Tono Odom farms, which are much lower in elevation, um, these wouldn't survive the summer in most cases. Um, some of the other beans, which you'll see, or actually they look like they're mostly dead already, but um, those are being grown for seed return, a seed return project that we're, they were working on for the Tarahumara people in the Sierra Madre in northern Mexico, uh, in Chihuahua. Uh, they've been really hit hard by uh, a prolonged severe drought and also um, several years in a row of late um, spring freezes just decimated their, their crops several years in a row. So they've been facing you know, famine, basically. And they've, they've um, in most cases, depleted their traditional seed stocks. And so we, we have hundreds of Tarahumara varieties of beans and corn and, and other crops in our seed bank. So we're working to grow them out, increase our supply, and return seeds to the Tarahumara communities. Um, so that they're not forced to adopt, you know, modern genetically modified varieties and basically lose their, their traditional agriculture. They're one of the, um, they have one of the most intact traditional agricultural systems of any native, native community um, in the Southwest, if not anywhere, um, due to their, the, isolate, the isolation of their, um, their, village, their communities. So this will be a multi-year project. We've already returned um, three, I think 350 pounds of seed. Um, we're going to return more later this year. And then uh, we're collaborating with a few different nonprofits down there who are working with different um, different parts in different parts of the Sierra with different Tarahumara groups. Um, and already we've we've returned varieties to villages where they haven't seen they haven't seen those varieties in, in a generation. So. Um, that, to me, is, is sort of um, a perfect illustration of why we exist as an organization, is to protect these, these varieties and um, support, support native communities in, in, in growing them. So what is canop grass, which is a native domesticate. Um, it was grown widely in the, south, in the southern part of the, of the southwestern region, to southern Arizona into Sonora. Um, and it was thought to be extinct for, for many years. And then um, our, two of our founders, Barney Burns and um, Gary Nabhan, rediscovered it in a Warahio native community in the Sierra Madre foothills, um, still being grown in these communities. And it's a, it's a very <laughs> drought tolerant grain. It's very nutritious, high in lysine. Um, it's, it's a good uh, bird feed if you care about that kind of thing. And it's a really beautiful plant. Very Is that the seed right there that you eat yeah, these, right on the top? They're still, they're still green. They're not ready to harvest yet. Um, it's a really fantastic crop. And one of, the, one of the few species that was domesticated in this region rather than being brought up here from uh, central Mexico or other places. So does, it, does each seed have like a little pod, or is it uh, just like an open? Um, an each, open each grain. Each seed is each fruit. Well, each yeah. seed is, is part of a fruit that's contained by uh, by bracts, just like in wheat. Mm -hmm. You see, yeah. in, in wheat or other grains. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, I'll just point out those those, shrub, those bushy green plants are chia. Uh, they're not flowering yet, but that's a um, there's several species of chia. That one is uh, Salvia hispanica, which is the chia that the Aztecs grew. Um, and if you're familiar with chia, you know it's, it's very uh, sort of a superfood, very high in omega-3 fatty acids and protein, and uh, very good for digestion, uh, lots of antioxidants, and so on. Um, so we're growing that. We sell the, we sell it as food. Um, we're going to start selling that species as seed also, which we have not done. There's also a native um, chia species in the, in the Sonoran Desert here uh, called Desert Chia, um, which we sell seeds of. There's another species um, known as Tarahumara Chia that's grown in the Sierra Madre.